Right, so today I'm going to finish chapter three. Uh, the last time we met, uh, we talked about formatting output. Okay, and there's a few more classes I wanted to go over before I talked about enumerated types and wrapper classes. And then once we're done with that, we'll go ahead and do chapter four, which will be the next class. And chapter four is actually kind of complicated. This is where I start losing the most students, um, but it is like really important to understand how to do chapter four in order for you to continue on to the next level. Um, so just be ready for that. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about some additional topics. Let me see, so where do we leave off? All right, so formatting output, if you guys remember, that was a number format, decimal format. I also gave an example of um, using the string format and the system out printf which is actually kind of neat. So some of the other classes I wanted to talk about are handling time. Like handling time is something that is actually done a lot in programming. So I'm not sure why the book doesn't cover this. Uh, let me go ahead and just open up Notepad++. All right, so I'm gonna call this one uh, calendar date example. All right, so there are a few classes in Java that you can use in order to print out the date and the time. It's gonna use the time that is actually on your computer. So if your clock on your computer is wrong, then this time is gonna be wrong as well. Um, there's also some new classes that were created in Java 8, I believe, that are also used to handle date and time. Uh, I'm not really that familiar with them. I do, but I'm gonna have to like look them up in order to use them, but uh, one of the ones that's been around for a while and I'm, I believe like the new classes are actually to kind of replace the way of the old way of getting the date and time but in the java.util dot uh, or excuse me the java.util package there's a class called calendar now you will have to know this class on your on your test and I'm going to ask you like what package calendar is in okay now the calendar class is, uh, is what we call a singleton there's only really one instance of the calendar class. So the way we get that is kind of the same way we do with the number format where to get the instance of the calendar, we're just gonna say like calendar and then like make up some identifier, we'll just say cal, and then through the class name, you'll get the instance. We just say like get instance. This is a static method that is going to return the calendar object. Now the way to think about this, the reason why there's only one instance of the calendar is like you really only need one calendar to know what the date and the time is right or the day of the month is if it would be like just having one calendar in a room that everybody shares and looks at and and they just that's how they can determine like when their birthday was or like when ho certain holidays are so once you get the calendar instance then you can like pull the date and time from this but i'm just going to go ahead for now i'm just going to just say like system that out that print line and just print out this object so you can see what um, the two string method on this thing looks like. So let me come over here and go to uh, containing folder. All right, so from here, I want to say Java C and then calendar date example. I'm gonna press enter and to run it. All right, and there's like that object that we just printed out. Now this is kind of difficult to read, but you can see that it's a Gregorian calendar. Uh, they give you time in milliseconds. Uh, you can kind of read all this stuff. You can see like that knows that the time zone is America, Chicago, and let's see what else can we decipher from this. Uh, there should be like a year and a month and a day. Um, oh, it says day of week, day of week. So two, I guess that would be, two would be Monday, because I guess 
Sunday would be one. And like it's using these integers to determine the time. All right, well, I mean, this is not very useful to us, right? It's the calendar, but we just don't, it's not really giving us any useful information. I mean, you could do things with the calendar, like say, okay, well, uh, give me like, I don't know, the day and time and all that by just calling like get, uh, let me see, get, and then you can do, you have to look this up because even I'm like, I don't even have all this memorized, but I think it's just calendar dot day maybe. Yeah, and we'll just see what happens when I do that. All right, and compile, dang it, I got that wrong. How about uh, day of month? Day of month. Compile and run. And you can see, well, I can't really tell, but it's saying it's the 24th. Is that right? Yeah, it is right, cool. All right, I mean, you can like pull off little bits and pieces of information like that. Uh, there's also this date object that you can use. Uh, it's, a lot of the methods are deprecated on it though, but you could just say like date is equal to new date. And then what you can do here is pass in the time in milliseconds from the calendar. There's a method on the calendar called uh, get time in milliseconds, I believe. And again, I'll have to look this up. I don't have all this memorized, but I'm gonna assume that's what it is. And now what I'm going to do is just print out the date, like right here. Set up. Print the date out there, but let me just go ahead and like cause a little bit of separation. So it's so kind of like not like right underneath all the date stuff. All right, so let me clear my screen. Compile. Didn't compile. Cannot find symbol. Okay, so the one thing I did wrong is I did not import the date class because that is also part of the uh, java.util package, so we do need to import it. So java.util.date, and let me try to recompile. Clear my screen, compile, and it cannot find symbol. Get time in milliseconds. Dang it. Um, get milliseconds, get time, I don't, I don't know. All right, well, let me just hop over to Java API. I'm gonna say uh, Java, API 8 and look for the calendar class but that is in Java UTIL okay click here and then scroll down to classes and click on calendar and I'm gonna go to like all the different methods in fact you know what I'm not gonna do that I'm just gonna just look milliseconds oh get time oh that's the name of the method is that the name of the method? All right, let me just scroll down to the methods. All right, so right here, this is where I'm trying to, oh no, that's all the static variables, I'm sorry. Okay, here are all the methods. So get time in milliseconds. Oh, okay, so I spelled it out. It looks like I should not have spelled it out. Let's just get time in millis, I guess. Yeah, I guess that's a word to them. I'm gonna go ahead and change that. Save it, come over here, compile, and run. And then here is that date object. So what I did was I created the date object, but I passed in the time in milliseconds. Because if you look at the constructor for the date, it takes in uh, milliseconds. And then I was able just to print out that value by just printing the object out. And this is what I got. Monday, February 24th. Time is the military time, so it's saying 1800, give me the minutes, the seconds, and the time zone, and the year, right? So it's pretty useful stuff, right? You can like print out the date on wherever this program is running. So you use the calendar, and then you get the date. You pass the millisecond to the date, and you can print it out. There's also a formatter for the date. So if you wanted to like format your date a particular way, you can use this formatter, and that's in java.txt. And the name of the formatter is called simple date format. Okay, and you come over here and declare an object. I'm gonna say simple date format is equal to new simple date format. And then inside of this constructor is where you put the type of um, the format you want. Now we we probably had, we need to look up this class because I don't have it all memorized. But like it's things like. MM is month, and then 
for a day, I believe, I believe it's lowercase d. I can't remember what uppercase d is. And then for year would be this lowercase, like you can do it, like you can use two digits for the year, or you can use four if you wanted to. And then the hour would be uh, lowercase h, I believe. Minute would be lowercase m. And then seconds, if you wanted seconds, would be uh, lowercase s. Now, if we wanted a.m. or p.m., then we would do uh, a, I'm pretty sure, time zone. I think it's just a z. All right, let's see what that looks like. Okay, so I created this simple date format, and now I'm going to use it the same way I use the normal format and the decimal format, where what I'm ready to use it, what I'm going to do is simply just uh, reference my object, which is simple date format, and call the method format and then pass in a date object and it should pull out whatever it needs to make a string that looks like that. Okay, so I'm looking at my screen and I'm going to compile and run. And there you go, I was able to guess that correctly. Okay, so two digits for the month, two for the year, or excuse me, for the day and then four for the year and then like now it's in not military time it's saying six but i did use two digits for the hour so it's putting a zero in front of it and then you have your minutes your seconds and then the uh, a.m or p.m and then the time zone okay if you go to your api and actually how much how helpful is this going to be i don't know we'll see i can't remember if it has it all in here Go to java.txt and then go to simple date format. It should, oh yeah, here it is. So it has all this stuff listed out of like what exactly you're trying to do. And you can use these little uh, letters when you're in your formatting so that you can tell the formatter how you want your date formatted. If you wanted to use day in year, it's a capital D, right? That would have given you the day within the year if you just, for some reason, just were so concerned about the day in the year. You can also get like AD, right? Um, let's see, what else can you do with this? Depending on how many M's you use, like you could either spell out July, have it like in numbers or um, or have it like uh, abbreviated for like three letters, right? So if I come back to my program and I just add an extra M here, okay? And I go to compile and run, before my month was indicated by the number two, now it should be indicated by uh, February, like FEB abbreviated. February abbreviated, um, yeah. And there you go, right? So by changing it from two M's to three, it gave me February instead of just zero two. All right, any questions on that? I mean, it's pretty useful. Um, date and time, like that's something you do all the time as a programmer when you're actually writing like real programs. Um, it's something that's useful. So that's like one way of doing it. Now there are some new classes to do this a little differently. Uh, let me go ahead and do another example. So I want to say new date and time. And I don't, I don't even know what, um, the package these things are in that tell you they are like I don't really use it that often so all right let me just create this class so public class the name of my class and then my main method all right so before I begin I need to actually know where these classes are located so I'm stuck I'm say Java and the name of the classes are uh, date time, I believe. Oh, local date time. That's what I couldn't remember what they're called. All right, local date time. Um, let me search one more time. So Java local date time all right so there is some api documentation for them 
and they're in the there's okay so there's a new package called java.time and that's where these are located now without even looking at it, uh, how to use it i'm just going to try to use it and we'll see what happens all right so i'm going to import uh java dot uh time dot local date time all right and i'm gonna say local local date time I've got to say like local date time is equal to new local date time all right Hopefully that actually works, unless, I don't know, maybe getting the instances through the class name, like the way the calendar is, but we'll, we'll find out right here. So I want to compile Java, and it's like new date time. Okay, it didn't compile, so it tells me that this is not the way I'm supposed to get a reference to the object. So let me hop back over here and actually read this class really quick. So I'm just going to arrow through. Um, All right, so we're just by scrolling through that and reading everything like super quick. No, I'm just kidding. I didn't read everything super quick, but uh, there is a method called, so like it, they are static. We, I could do something like this, local date time, and then do like now, something like that. And I'm supposed to be able to get the local date time from there, and I believe I can just print that out. Let's see what happens when I print it out. All right. If not, then I'm going to have to look up a real example. All right, that worked. That compiled. That's good. And that's the local date time. I don't know how much I like that. Um, I, I think you can use the simple date formatter to format this stuff. So I'm going to just slap that there. And I'm going to copy this over here. Let's have a formatter. And I believe I still need a date object though. So I don't know if local date time will, I can pass local date time to my simple date formatter, but we'll find out. If it doesn't compile, then I'll just look it up real quick. Mm. Compile, yes, it compiled. That's, that's good news, I guess. No, didn't work. All right, so, um, Let me see if I can get a date object from this. Date, date, date. I didn't see one. All right, uh, let me just search uh, Java local date time, simple date format. Oh, it's something different, dang. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that are different now. So I guess the simple date format doesn't work with this. You got to make something called the date formatter. You specify a pattern of pattern, and then you once you have your local date time, you just apply that formatter. Hold on, wait, wait, where does the formatter go? Here's a formatter. Oh, you, you pass it to the local date time object. That's so weird. Okay. Format, formatter, it's gonna return a string. Okay, so I need this. I don't know where this, what package that lives in though. Um, let me just look that up real quick. So I'm say Java, good date time formatter, and click over here. What package is that? It's also in the time, java.time. Okay, that makes things convenient. So then I don't, I'm not gonna use this simple date formatter. I'm gonna use something called date time formatter. And that's in the time package, so I had to change the package name. And I, you just say date formatter, uh, I don't know, date formatter. And it was static, like it's a static, there's a static method called uh, 
of format. Is that what I saw? Let me dim it real quick. Of pattern. Okay, so of pattern, and then we pass in a pattern there. I'm going to copy this pattern that I used over here and hope that it actually works the same. And then once we have this formatter here, then what I can do, it's a little different, a little backwards than what I just showed you, is you'll just say, and then what was it again? Format? No, it was date format. I have to look this up. Uh, yeah, it was format. And then you pass in your formatter. That's a little backwards to me, the way that I'm used to doing it. Format, and then pass in the formatter. Yeah, let me just look one more time. Yeah, I mean, I did exactly what they did. So, um, compile. Dang it. Java time date formatter. Did I misspell that? Is it date format or date formatter? Date time format. Oh, I'm sorry. It's in the Java time format package. Okay, this is making things a little more complicated, I guess. So there's a package called Java, there's a package called Java Time Format. And it still didn't like what I did. Unable to extract the value from the local date time. Uh dang. I wonder if it's just one of these characters that it doesn't like. Let me just, just do month and year. Yeah, so I don't know what character it does not like, but it didn't like something in here. Uh, let me just get rid of the time zone. Oh, you know what, maybe it's the time zone because it's date and time. It didn't say anything about the actual time zone, right? So I'll save that and compile. Yeah, so it seems to be time zone was a problem with that. Anyways, this is new class. I'm not quite sure uh, the benefit of it, but from things that I've heard, it's supposed to handle the date and the time better uh, for like localization of like where the user is actually located, who's actually using your program, right? So. Uh, local date time is supposed to work with the that culture's uh, date and time. Uh, there's also two other classes that are similar. I'm not sure what the benefit of using the one over the other is, but there is a class called just local date and a class just called local time. Like if you just wanted to use time and not date and one where you just want to use date and not time. So I'm just going to copy what I did here and get rid of that. And then this one, I'll get rid of that. So I'm using local date time, local date, local time. I'm going to change these identifiers. Wait, I don't want to do that. I still want to keep the L. I just want to get rid of, yeah, that looks right. And here I'll get rid of the date perfect now I'm just going to do a system dot 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 print line okay and I'm gonna copy and paste what I did here slap it no oh dang I must it up slap it right here and change this to local date local date I'm still gonna use a date formatter I might mess up with the time stuff here but we'll find out all right, and um, change this one to local time. Local time. All right, let's see what happens. Oh, dang, I set up. Yes, it broke. It did exactly what I thought it would. Okay, so because I'm assuming there's time on this, this is local date, it doesn't really like having the um, this time stuff here I'm just formatting the local date so what I'm gonna do is just gonna slap this right here like I'm 
like passing in like the instance of a static formatter and I'm just gonna say month day year like that all right and then for this time one I'm gonna do the exact same thing I'll slap in that there and I'll just copy over this time all right, and I believe that should fix the problem. Let's find out. Dang it, I did the exact same thing. I ran it with the dot class name. All right, and that did fix the problem. Okay, so uh, if you're using the local date, you, you didn't really like having the time formatted on it, right? And if you're using the, wait, is that the date? That looks weird, right? 18. Doesn't make sense to me. Did I do the same thing twice? Local date. The second one should have been. So this is the top one, right? The local date, time. This is. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry. I, I printed the object twice. I was. I'm confusing myself. Okay, so this is the local time. This is the local date, and this is the local date time. I, I was I thought this was the local date and this is the local time but local dates right here I guess I should have like labeled it on up on top in fact let me just do that really quick that way it's not confusing anybody who's gonna go back and look at this let's say like local time local date and this is the local date all right, now turn my screen. Oops, turn my screen. Compile. Run. Right. All right, and that's a little less confusing, right? So here's me formatting the local date, local time, and local date time. So I don't know which one's easier. Uh, this is like using the calendar class. Like this is the way I've done it for years, right? But I'm assuming Java wants me to start doing things using this local date time, local date, and local time. Um, it does, I guess it might be a little easier because you don't have to, you don't, like if I just wanted the local time or the local date, like I don't have to import like a bunch of different classes, right? So if you're gonna do it the old way, I'm gonna need all three of these classes to like make something that I can actually read, right? Uh, be outputted. Where over here, I guess really all you need is the formatter and one of these classes okay all right so that is the time and the date uh, like i said it's something that you're all, like every program you're ever going to do in a professional uh professionally like you're going to have to manage time somehow whether you're keeping track of when a user filled out a form or um, when you got a response back from a server right you're, like at some point you're going you're to keep track of time so this is actually kind of important knowing how to get date and time. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and do the next two sections in chapter three, which is enumerated types. Enumerated types is actually really useful. They're used a lot. We will go into more detail on these in Java 2. Um, I, don't, I, don't plan on a, I do not plan on testing you on, on them, but it's just something that you should know. I don't know who you're gonna take for Java 2. Maybe they might expect you to actually know this because it is part of chapter three. So I am gonna go ahead and talk about it. I'm gonna read the slides and then I'll do an example. Um, but it's actually pretty interesting how enumerated types work. So I'm gonna go ahead and just start reading this. All right, so Java allows you to define an enumerated type, which can then be used to declare variables. An enumerated type declaration lists all possible values of a variable of that type. The values are identifiers of your own choosing the following declaration creates an enumerated type called season, enum, season, winter, spring, summer, fall. Any values can be listed. Uh, once the type is defined, a variable of that type can be declared by saying the name of the enumeration, season, and then some identifier. And it can be assigned a value as the name of the enumeration dot the uh, enumeration that you want it to be, right? They created spring, summer, fall. Uh, winter so it has to be one of those four choices the values are referenced through the name of the type 
Enumerated types are type safe. You cannot assign any other uh, any other value other than those listed. Ordinal values. Internally, each value of an enumerated type is stored as an integer called the, its ordinal value. The first value in the enumeration type has an ordinal value of zero, the second one one, and so on. However, you cannot assign an enumerated value to any enumerated type, even though, even if it corresponds to a valid ordinal type. Okay, so what they mean is an ordinal value is just some number that Java is going to assign to the very first item that you created. So here's an enumeration that the book created. It said enum, and the name of the enumeration uh, was season. And they said winter, spring, summer, fall. Winter would have been zero. Spring is one. Summer is two. And then fall is three because that's the order in which they're listed. That is what the ordinal value is. In some other programming languages, you can use that number to reference the type of value that you want. But in Java, you cannot. Right? You have to just reference the actual enumerated type. The declaration of enumerated type is a special type of class and each variable of that type is an object. An ordinal method returns the ordinal value of an object. The name method returns the name of the identifier cor corresponding to uh, the object value. And then they give you an example by doing their uh, favorite flavors of ice cream. And then they move on to the next section. All right, so let me go ahead and explain that because that was like kind of weird, like reading all those uh, new terms like enumerated type, ordinal value. And let me just do an example of this really quick. So I'm going to make a new uh, program. And let's see. Um, I don't know. They did seasons already. We'll do months, OK? So I'm going to say enumeration. I'll say enum month example. Okay, so I have public class, name of my class, and then public static void main string array. All right. All right, so the way this works, and this is kind of weird, is you're going to declare your enumeration outside of your main method. So up here is where we'll say enum. Okay, and then you just give it some type of name. It like you decide on the name on the name. We'll just say month, and then we'll list out all the months that we want to have an enumeration for. So we'll say like Jan, January, uh, February, March, April, May, June, July, uh, August, September. October, November, and December. All right, so I put all the months in there. And the way this enumeration works is I've now declared a new class, right, uh, that can only be these values that are listed inside of here. So if I want to create a variable to hold a month, what I would do is say, okay, well, I'm going to say month, and then we'll just say, like, my favorite month, okay? Now, in order to assign it some value, you have to assign it a value that you specified up here. And the way you reference that value is through the month name, or through the enumeration name, which is month, and then the month that you want to assign, which would be March. Now, the book put the seasons in lowercase, but since these are actually constants, by naming convention, your enumeration should be in all uppercase. Okay, so I put all mine in caps. It's just the way uh, most places, uh, like that's the coding standard for most places for enumerations, is to put it in all caps. Now that I have this variable that's holding a month that I created up above, I can just do something like this, like system out print line, and then just print out my, or actually I'll do this, I'll say my favorite month is, and then I'll print out that variable, okay? And let's just do that for now, and then I'll show you the name and the enumerated type, or the ordinal types. All right, so what I'm going to do here is compile. And run. All 
All right, and now that's what I got. My favorite month is March. Um, there is something called name, which doesn't really do much for us because it's going to just give you whatever it is you named it. I can, I can invoke name on my variable from the enumeration, and I can also invoke the ordinal type. Or not the ordinal, excuse me, the ordinal value. So it's just ordinal. Ordinal, is that the way you spell it? I think so. Okay, my favorite month. Uh, ordinal, my favorite month name. All right, and you can see that the name doesn't really do anything exciting. <laughs> Sorry, my brain farted. All right, um, compile and then run. So I don't know if you guys, well, I'll show this to you. All right, so here's the output. So here's the ordinal value for March, it's two. It's because it's the third month in the list, right? You start with zero, and then the next one is one, and the next one's two. Uh, and the name for for that value is March. Now, I don't know if you guys saw this, but like if I do like a DIR, actually, let me clear my screen. If I do a DIR, you can see that for the enumerated type, um, there is like this, here's a class, right? But there's also this weird class right here. It created two files, right? If you look at all the other files, like, calendar date example there's only two files right the java and the class file that it created but for the enumerated type it actually created two class files and that's because it recognized that month enumeration and it made like its own class for it which is part of the enum month example class that's why there's like this dollar sign here so for me to reference the month i have to come through the enum month example but since i'm already in that class i don't have to uh, use the full name of enum month example but if I wanted to use it like in a different location like over here uh, this is the new date time and the just say I just wanted to make something called month here and to say uh, my month and I'll set it equal to month dot gen now I could actually use it here because all these files are located in the same location. So if I just wanted to like print out what this month is, this would actually work except I need to reference also the class name. I'm not doing that. I'm just <laughs> referencing the enumeration name. So I'm just gonna say like my month here and then I'll print out the my month. Okay, now when I try to go to compile, I want to get the uh, symbol or you know, cannot find symbol error. So this is, that was the date time example. Okay, I'm going to compile and Java's upset. It can't find the symbol month. And that's because I have to reference this class name first and then I can use the actual month. Okay, so I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to put the name of the class dot month and I have to do the same thing over here name of the class dot month all right now when I hop back over here clear my screen compile it compiles and then when I run this date and time you can see that I was able to get the month right there I was able to use that enumeration in a different class because I defined it both of those files were in the same location so all I had to do was just reference it and that class was created inside of that enumeration example class. I had to use that full name and then the name of the enumeration. So the name of the class and then the name of the enumeration, I was able to use it here. But inside of my enum month example, I don't have to reference the whole class. I can just go with month, okay? So that's the way you create enumeration. You're basically limiting all the possible values for month to these values. Enumerations, it looked pretty primitive. And you might think like, what's the point in this? But they're, they're actually used a lot. Okay, in Java 2, we'll talk about how to actually customize them to make them a lot more useful. Uh, one of the other things I wanted to show you, which we'll talk about in, by the end of this class, is this enumeration actually gives you back an array. And you can use that array just to list out all the possible values for a month. And I'm going to use this for each loop that we have in Java. Um, just something you don't need to know, but I just want to show you like what we can do with this. 
So I'm basically what I'm going to do is I'm make a for each loop and I'm going to grab every month out of that container from my month uh, enumeration. And I believe it's called values, right? So this method here values on my enumeration will just return is a container of all the possible values for a month. And I can just loop through this and just say system dot out dot print line. Um, I do an empty print line to kind of cause some visual separation. And then I'll just list out the month and then I'll list out the month's ordinal value. Or maybe I'll do the ordinal value up top. Maybe it'll be better to see the zero first or the ordinal value and then the actual month. Okay, so that's what this is doing. We'll talk more about that at the end of the semester. But I'm basically pulling out values from uh, this array here. This values method is returning an array. I'm storing each one of those into this variable that's designed to hold an enumerated type. So if I hop over here, clear my screen, and compile enumerated example, and then run it. Right, and there's all my values. So January was a zero, February one, right? Uh, March was the second one, and so on, all the way to December. So I was able to iterate over that list and just print out all the examples, right? So you can get the possible values by calling the values method on an enumeration if you're interested in seeing all of them. I know it's a little adventure, what we're at right now, but this is something that we will do uh, in the future, so. I just want to show that to you. All right, so let's hop back over to the lecture. Okay, so numerator types, I know that's kind of complicated, but it is something that's important to know. Um, they're actually used a lot in programming. Um, but what I want you to know about them is think about them as a class with constant values. Okay, so you're making this uh, class to where you don't have a bunch of different instances of them. You only have specific instances, right? In this case, we had you can only have a January, a February, a March, April, so on, so on, so on, all the way up to December. You can't have anything else, just those values, right? For the season, you can only have four values, winter, spring, summer, and fall, and that's it. So it's just kind of a way of setting uh, values to a particular range that you know the value is going to be constant, okay? All right, um, let's move on to the wrapper classes, which is another pretty interesting topic. So we have eight primitive data types. Each primitive data type has what we call a wrapper class. There's some classes or some methods and classes that don't allow you to pass in primitive data. So instead of not <coughs> passing in primitive data at all, Java has come up with these classes to essentially wrap a primitive data uh, inside of an object so that we can pass data of primitive types as an object. And those methods that do not allow primitive data to go into it uh, will accept the wrapper class. Um, I'm just going to read these slides. Like, oh, like once again, I'm not really going to uh, test you on this, but it's, all, it's just good to know because there's a lot of useful methods on these wrapper classes. All right, so let's see. So wrapper classes, the following declaration creates an integer object that represents an int, the integer 40, as an object. So there's a declaration, integer spelled all the way out with a capital I, age, is equal to new integer, they pass in a 40. An object of a REPL class can be used in a situation where primitive value will not suffice. For example, some objects serve as containers of other objects. Primitive values cannot be stored in such containers, but uh, wrapper objects could be. Okay, so the containers that they're talking about are, li are list. There is a class called list in Java where that only accepts objects and not primitive data. So if you wanted to put primitive data inside of a list, we would have to actually put it into a wrapper and then put it into the list. All right, uh, wrapper classes also contain static methods that help manage the associated type. For example, the integer class contains methods to convert an integer stored in a string into an int value. So num uh, integer parse int uh, if your num is equal to integer parse int and they pass it in the string, they often contain useful constants as well. For example, the integer class contains min value and max value, which holds the smallest and largest int values. Okay, that is actually a pretty useful 
uh, thing about a wrapper class is, let me just create an example. You can actually get the min and max values for that data type. Um, let me save this. I'm gonna call this one wrapper class, oops, wrapper class example. All right, so public class, the name of my class, and public static void main string array. Arguments. All right, so what I'm gonna do here is just call a static method on the integer. Okay, so say max value for an int. If you want to know the max value, you can just say like integer and it was a max value, right? Max. Is it max value or max value? I can't remember. Okay, max value. All right, so uh, I can call that and come over here, compile and run. All right, and there's the max value for an integer. Uh, you can do the same thing with the other primitive data types. There's also some really useful static methods like converting uh, like to hexadecimal. It is it? I don't actually, I do not know. I think it might actually not be a static method. Uh, I'll have to look this up real quick. But there's a lot of useful methods that you can use on the integer class. Um, so this is part of the java.lang package. So if you go to java.lang, you can see that there's these wrapper <coughs> classes here. The one I want to look into more is the integer class. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to scroll down and you can get all the different methods that you can call. Things that are static are things that you can call through the class name. One of the useful ones is parsing a string to an integer. Uh, actually, let me show you how that works because this is pretty useful. So let's just say that you take in data as a string. You ask for the user's age and they entered in age and they put in like uh, 78, right? And then you try to store that into uh, an integer val and you just said age. Okay, that's not gonna work, right? Java's gonna get upset because you're trying to convert an integer, or excuse me, a string into an integer. It's gonna be really upset with you, incompatible types, blah, 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 right? Uh, one of the things that you can do with the integer, or in fact, all the wrapper classes, is you can convert to that particular type. So you know, there's one called parse int. I don't know why the book uses this one. I don't know if, what's the benefit of using the other one, but there's also one called integer.valueof. Um, so now when I come over here to compile, it compiles and it will run. I don't think running will actually show anything because I'm not printing this value out, but you, I was able to essentially convert this string to an integer and then store it into a variable that holds a primitive data type. Okay. Uh, some of the other useful ones here are, uh, I thought there was like one to convert. Oh, well, you can compare two integers, get the max and the min, the same thing that we do with the math class. Number of leading zeros. Hmm. Interesting. Oh, dang, you can reverse an integer, is that true? I just saw one called reverse. I've never seen that one before. I don't play with these classes enough to know, like, all the fine details of them, but I just saw one called reverse. Returns the value of the obtained by reversing the order of bits into two's complement binary representing the specific int value. All right, so that means that if I had, okay, let's just say the age was seven, eight, nine. Okay, and I print out that value. I'll just say like uh, system dot out that print line age. I print out the value. Now I should get seven eight nine, right? That makes sense. But then what happens if I call um, reverse?
and I believe it was a static cloud or sta yeah, static method. So I just we'll do this and then pass in value. All right, let's see what happens. So come over here and compile. And I forgot to put semicolon. Dang it. Compile again and then run. Oh, that, that's not exact. That's not what I expected to happen. Hmm. Okay, so I guess that's actually taking some numeric representation of integer and doing two's complement. I have no idea. Like, I'm not really that hardcore to math, so somebody else can probably figure that out. Dang, that was kind of disappointing. All right. Well, one of the other ones that I think is actually pretty interesting is converting numbers to binary. I mean, learning binary is something that you need to do in programming at some point in your life. Um, there is this method called static, right? It returns a string, it says to binary. So it's basically gonna take whatever energy you have and convert it to binary. So you can make like a binary table if you wanted to. Uh, we'll talk about this more with in chapter five using four loops, but I'm just gonna say like int x is equal to zero while x is less than, we'll just go up to uh, 100, x plus plus, okay? And we'll just say something like this, system dot out dot print line, we'll say x would be the actual value that we're converting, and uh, let's say integer dot, is it two binary? and then pass in x. All right, let me make sure I got that method correct. No, two binary string. All right. Come over here and let's turn my screen. Compile. All right, and it converted all that to binary. And if I scroll up to the top, Right, so zero in binary is zero, one is one, two is 10, three is 11, four is 100, five is 101, and so on, right? So that's, I mean, we're able to create the actual values by just using these methods. Okay, uh, let me hop back to the lecture and finish this off. So uh, there's a lot of useful static methods you can call on these wrapper classes. I suggest just taking a look and seeing if there's anything cool that you can do with some particular uh, wrapper class the char one is pretty there the character one is pretty interesting okay uh, auto boxing so auto boxing happens when you pass a primitive data type to um, a a, prim a a primitive type to its corresponding wrapper type and it just basically makes it a object instead of a primitive data so here you have num so here they're declaring the, they're making an integer that like they're making an integer for or an object for integer and then here they're actually using primitive data. They just assign it to each other and it's called auto boxing. I've never heard the term auto boxing anywhere except for this book. So I don't know how, how like how many people actually use that term, but I've never heard it unless like only from this book. Um, and that's it. Any questions on chapter three? Pretty interesting, huh? It's really complicated, I know, but uh, just wait till you see chapter four. So there is a lot of homework from chapter three and uh, chapter two was due last Friday. So I do expect you to show me your chapter two homework. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I'm not gonna give you guys a quiz because I know you have a lot of work to do. I want you guys to catch up on your work. Don't use this time to go home and like uh, not do anything. Um, like I want you to go home and like program. Like just like you need to program every day if you want to keep up with this class. It's only gonna get worse. If you think it's bad now, just wait, like give me like at least a month and you'll be completely lost, okay? So the only way to keep up with this class is to program every single day, right? I give you a shit ton of homework assignment problems, but I don't want you to do it in one day. I want you to do like one a day, right? Or at least part of one a day, right? Like <coughs> as you come to the due date, like you should have done like the, like 3.1, you should probably try to do like the first day that we talked about chapter three. Right, and then just keep kind of moving down the line. If you put it off to the last minute, it's gonna be obvious you're not gonna learn anything. 
And then when it's time to take your midterm, you're going to do really bad. Okay? So as you're doing this, as you're programming it, you need to start putting it to your, to your memory so that you can actually do this on your midterm. Because on your midterm, I'm going to ask you questions, like just straight up, like write a program that does this. You're not going to have a book. You're not going to be able to look up anything on the Internet. You're going to have to just type it from straight memory muscle. Like that's what I'm going to expect you guys to do. Okay? I wrote a program that said, or I tell you to write a program that prompts the users for his first and last name and then takes the first character of the first name and the first five characters of the last name and adds a random number between 10 and 99 to the end of that to create a username. Like, you should be able to do that on the midterm because that's actually one of my popular midterm questions is to do something like that. Right? Like, like that's just something that you need to start practicing so that you can do that without the help of a book or the internet. Like just, you know how to write public, uh, public class, name of your class, public static void main. Uh, you know how to declare the scanner, to import the scanner, prompt the user, store data, use char at zero, use substring, um, generate a random number. Like those are the types of things that I'm gonna expect you to know how to do. Okay, so the next class is gonna, chapter four is, is gonna be like, I don't want to say it's difficult. Uh, some students have a hard time understanding the concept because we're basically what we're going to do is we're going to write our own classes so that we can create our own objects, right? And it's really important because you need to understand Chapter 4 in order to move on to Java 2 because in Java 2 you're going to talk about inheritance, which is only going to uh, add on to the topics from Chapter 4. All right, so that, that's all I have. You guys are free to go. But I want you guys to program today and program tomorrow. Just program every day.